Hello, and welcome to our Keating University's BI-327 Histology course. Um, this lecture is part of the Cytology lecture, uh, the Cell Biology lecture, and in this mini lecture, we're going to be taking a look at the plasma membrane. Okay, the plasma membrane uh, is also informally known uh, in many cases as the cell membrane. Uh, but it's important to recognize that it's not just the membrane around the outside of the cell. The cell membrane, the plasma membrane, is going to be found uh, surrounding uh, structures within the cell. Membrane-bound structures, uh, like the rough endoplasmic reticulum, like the nucleus, uh, are going to have membranes formed in the same way as that external cell membrane, although the characteristics may be a little bit different. But they're the same basic plasma membrane components. There are going to be three biochemical components associated with the plasma membrane. Uh, but again, taking the, uh, this and putting it into the perspective of our earlier lectures, the plasma membrane is not visible uh, with light microscopy. We can't use uh, the light microscope and be able to see at the level of resolution to be able to discriminate where that boundary is. However, because of the staining characteristics, we can infer where the plasma membrane is going to be located. If we take a look at uh, how it's going to be uh, essentially composed, the biochemical components associated with it, we're going to have phospholipids, which are going to be present for the formation of a hydrophobic barrier. We're going to have proteins, which contribute a lot of the function associated with the membrane. Uh, most importantly, they're going to be contributing to the semi-permeable barrier properties associated with the plasma membrane. And then finally, we're going to have carbohydrates, essentially a sugar-coated uh, external surface. Uh, which is going to be important for external cell recognition and interaction between the plasma membrane and, and surrounding cells and surrounding structures. <clears throat> if we take a look at uh, the basic properties of the membrane, is we know that it's going to have a hydrophobic property, hydrophobic water-fearing property, because essentially as an aqueous organism, our cells are going to be full of water, and the surrounding body is going to be found, formed with water. And so what we need is to have a hydrophobic barrier, which is going to be present. And this is because of the phospholipids, the sphingolipids, and cholesterol. We're essentially going to have this fatty layer that's going to form this boundary point. And it's going to restrict the movement of materials from outside of the cell, inside of the cell, or from inside of the cell, outside of the cell. And so this is going to be important because we want to be able to regulate the passage of materials. And so the major components associated with the hydrophobic properties of the membrane are going to be the phospholipids. The phospholipids are described as an amphipathic molecule. Amphipathic meaning it essentially has two characteristics associated with it. It's going to have a polar phosphate containing head. And so this is essentially uh, the diagram on the right hand side, this hydrophilic head that we're looking at uh, in the region. And hydrophilic meaning that it can interact with water. And so it's going to interact with the water outside of the cell. It's going to interact with the water inside of the cell. But associated with this, within this amphipathic molecule, are going to be nonpolar or hydrophobic fatty acid tails. And these fatty acid tails, again, attached to that hydrophobic phosphate-containing head, are going to extend down, and they're going to contribute to the hydrophobic properties of the membrane. They're going to block the passage of water and materials suspended within the water uh, through the membrane. And so what we're going to have then is a lipid bilayer. So we're going to have the hydrophilic heads, those polar phosphate containing heads, towards the inside of the cell, towards the external world. But these nonpolar hydrophobic fatty acid tails are going to be towards one another. And they're going to form the core of this plasma membrane. And again, they're going to restrict the passage of materials that are suspended in water across the plasma membrane, across this boundary. Proteins are the second component uh, associated with the plasma membrane. Proteins are going to be about 50% of the membrane weight, and they're going to be important because they're going to provide specific functions associated with the membrane. And we could have integral membrane proteins. Integral membrane proteins are going to be essentially embedded either within half of this phospholipid bilayer, or in some cases, they're going to be embedded all the way through the membrane. And so they're going to essentially extend from the cytoplasmic side to that extracellular side. There are also going to be some peripheral membrane proteins. And these are almost like surface proteins that are loosely associated with either the inner membrane or the outer membrane. 
And again, the presence of these proteins is going to be important because it's going to contribute to the specialized functions associated with the membrane itself. Some basic examples of membrane protein functions. Uh, we could have uh, the proteins that expand across the entire membrane and where they could serve as pumps by actively transporting materials across the membrane. Or they could form channels, which are essentially almost like tunnels or passageways through which small ions or molecules can pass through the membrane. By passing down through the core of this protein, they're not going through that phospholipid bilayer. They're essentially bypassing it by moving through this distinct passageway, this distinct, distinct tunnel through uh, the plasma membrane. We can have receptors, uh, which are going to be important for recognizing and binding the substances. So if we think back to the example we had previously with the acetylcholine receptor on the surface of a muscle cell, it's able to bind to that neurotransmitter and trigger some type of change in the muscle cell itself. We can have transducers. Uh, transducers are going to convert that external signal into an internal message. Uh, these could be proteins that activate a cyclic AMP uh, process. We can have membrane proteins that are enzymes that are going to be controlling chemical reactions, uh, essentially controlling what the cell is going to be doing. Uh, or we could have structural proteins, which are involved with anchoring the membrane to either cellular structures inside of it or to surrounding structures on the outside of the cell. And then the final component, we had uh, the lipids, we had the proteins, the final component are going to be the carbohydrates. The carbohydrates are going to be found essentially as a sugar coating, it's referred to as the glycocalyx, along the outside of the cell. And so we're talking about oligosaccharide or essentially multiple um, sugar subunits hooked together onto either lipids or proteins on the membrane allowing them to become glycolipids, glycolipid for sugar lipids, or glycoprotein for sugar proteins, by essentially interacting with that external surface, adding the sugar associated to that region. And this is going to be involved with things like cell adhesion and cell recognition. So again, controlling the way that these cells are going to be interacting with their surrounding environment. Now, if we take a look at the properties associated with the membrane, and again, many of the properties are going to be associated with the proteins, we know that the plasma membrane is described as selectively permeable. Okay, so it's going to form a barrier. We don't want things to essentially just pass, everything to pass right across that into the cell or right from the cell outside of the, uh, the cell to the surrounding areas. We want to be able to control the movement of materials. And so one way in which we can do this is the semi selectively permeable, semi-permeable properties of the membrane, meaning that we can control the passage of materials. And so we could have, in this case, an integral membrane protein, which is involved with the movement of materials. And so we can have passive diffusion, and in this case, we've looked at essentially a tunnel through the membrane where molecules can move down their concentration gradient, essentially diffuse, in this case, into the cell, uh, by passing through this. Uh, a slightly more complicated version of this is facilitated diffusion. So again, still helping it across the membrane. It's going to be unidirectional. It's going to follow a concentration gradient, but it's not requiring cellular, cellular energy, ATP energy, uh, to do so. The counter to that, again, using this property of selectively permeable, but wanting to control the movement of materials across our membrane, is the concept of active transport. Active transport is essentially moving molecules that are non-diffusible, so they can't diffuse through one of our, our tunnels, or we're going to be moving them against the concentration gradient. And so because of this, it's more difficult and it's going to require energy. Uh, the most common example is we're pumping materials across a membrane to either accumulate them outside of the membrane or accumulate them within the cell. Moving them against our concentration gradient is going to require us to use ATP energy. The cell membrane, as we said, is going to have receptors involved with signal transduction. So in this example, we've got a hormone as a little blue triangle binding to the receptor. When it does so, it causes that signal to be transferred to the inside of the cell, in this case by activating a cyclic AMP system. And so we can transmit a signal to the interior and either turn things off, turn things down, turn things up. Uh, but basically control what's going on within the cell. Now the plasma membranes, as we said, 
often referred to as the cell membrane because that major component around the outside of the cell, but we're also going to have plasma membranes involved with the compartmentalization of subcellular structures, smaller structures within the cell that remain membrane bound. And these are going to be important for when we want to store materials, we want to transport materials without losing them or having them fuse away within the cell, or when we want to do very controlled regulated secretion. Uh, it's important that we have these membrane-bound structures so we can concentrate and isolate the substances into specific regions of the cell where we can keep them controlled and regulated. Now, the organelles are going to have very different uh, characteristics. They're going to have different materials with them, depending upon what type of organelles we're talking about. Now, one of the most common examples of looking at membrane-bound structures within a cell are to look at endocytosis and exocytosis. So this is essentially the movement of materials within membrane-bound structures. And so we're essentially pinching off a region of the membrane and moving materials within this membrane-bound structure to another region and then using that membrane-bound structure, fusing it with that new membrane and dumping the materials into that new space. And so we could be essentially engulfing material from the outside of the cell bringing it into the cell within a membrane-bound structure, and that would be something like phagocytosis or penocytosis, depending upon the magnitude of, of things that are being brought in. Or we could have exocytosis, exocytosis where we would have proteins that are synthesized within the cell, stored within a membrane-bound vesicle, essentially moving to the surface, fusing with that surface plasma membrane, and then dumping those materials outside of the cell. So this is something like the release of digestive enzymes from the cells. Uh, the release of neurotransmitter in the example we had previously when we we're releasing neurotransmitter from the nerve to trigger that muscle cell. These are examples of exocytosis. So storage of materials, transport of materials within a membrane-bound vesicle, but then a very controlled release by fusion of our membrane-bound vesicle with the plasma membrane to either dump it outside of the cell or dump it into another membrane-bound structure. As always, if you have any questions, feel free to email me at hoffmanj at arcadia.edu. Thanks, and I'll see you at part three of this lecture.